can hear me right yes so, okay great so today we are talking about stack and staggered microviews uh, and really overall how to optimize your design for manufacturing and uh it's really, uh, I'm going to start with a little bit of a preamble. It's really a partnership between design engineers and the manufacturer to get the stack upright and how, what is the build strategy uh, going to be, especially for a complex stack up. So I say this all the time, but it's really important to talk to your manufacturer as early as possible with what you're trying to do as you're making your critical stack up decisions. So today uh, we have a lot in store for you. It's about an hour. Uh, I really enjoy questions, ask, ask away. And uh, we have a team of people here to answer. And if there's anything we can't answer, which does happen from time to time, we will talk to process engineers to get back to you with a more thorough uh, answer. One thing about Sierra, so some exciting things are happening at Sierra. We've been a prototype manufacturer uh, for about 30 years in California, uh, sunny Sunnyvale, California. We last year uh, acquired a production facility in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, which allows us to manufacture larger volumes um, and at a lower cost. And the right uh, type of business for that is still like higher value production, uh, but uh, you know, NADCAP certification requirements or ITAR certifications or you know specialty boards, but more at a volume stage. And we also have volume assembly as well, uh, prototype and volume assembly. So a lot of good things happening at Sierra to help customers along their journey from prototype to production. So we're very excited about all those things. Uh, here's the table of contents for today. In the beginning, we'll just go over some basics, but very quickly, and then we'll go into some design tools that we offer free on our website, and then talk about some examples of stack ups and how our build strategy is for those stack ups. According to the IPC, a standard for interconnection is a, in the circuit board. Microvia is a blind structure uh, that with a one-to-one -one aspect ratio and a diameter of less than 150 microns or uh, six mils. So why do we talk about microvias? There's a lot of advantages to microvias if done properly. Um, even with the ability to reduce cost. In addition, microvias can bring down the signal reflections and crosstalk due to overall shorter signal paths. So there's lots of advantages of microvias. So when creating a microvia, you can use a mechanical drill and you can also use a laser drill. Laser drill is most often preferred a little bit more precise in the control depth drill. It basically stops at the next copper layer. And it also provides a V shape, which is easier for plating. Laser drills are not a end all be all, but they're the most common way to form a microvia. One uh, disadvantage is that if you're laser drilling through multiple different material types, it's hard to get the right, um, let's say, power in it that you should be using for your laser. So you have to be careful with that. And again, we're stopping at the copper beneath, so there's some disadvantage there. Um, but overall, it's the right approach or the most right approach. Aspect ratio is really important for plating, uh, not so much for drilling. And the ratio is basically the ratio between the drill depth and the diameter of the drilled hole. The ideal aspect ratio 
according to IPC is one to one. We offer one to one only on select areas or select situations. We prefer 0.75 to one. So if you consider the dielectric of a three mil thickness, the drill diameter can be calculated by using the formula that we show. Your drill diameter would be four, um, and it can be larger, but a minimum of four. The staggered vias are always better than stacked for many reasons. Uh, the two reasons that I can say right now are that um, it's less process steps and less process steps means less yield loss uh, and less, less cost. But you have to make sure that your design is suitable for staggered microbias. Um, so for a staggered via really to be possible, the vertical separation between the centers of the two microbias must be greater than the whole diameter. So at least two mils of spacing. If you stagger, in this case, this via here does not need to be filled. And this via here, if it's, let's say, under an SMT pad, can be filled. Now you're saving a step of filling this via here. So some pros and cons of staggered vias. So when you're staggering the via, the drill positions are optimally spaced apart. This can reduce crosstalk and signal reflections. And staggered vias ensure the design's longevity um, because you can stand more thermal cycles. And there are tests that prove that. And I think that's now common knowledge for people who are really involved with stack microvias. So the con is you do require more space compared to stack vias. I think the other con is that it's a little bit tougher to design. You can't just create a drill structure in your design tool that's, let's say, from layer one to three. You have to have multiple or more drill structures and more drill files. If you're not using uh, ODD or IPC 2581, you would end up sending us more, you know, separate drill files for each layer. And those can be missed or by you, I mean, not by us. Okay. So what are the manufacturing considerations for stack vias? So stack vias consist of two annular rings on top, on the top and the bottom. The upper one signifies the precise hole registration and the bottom one is used for the electrical connection. So you have to fill copper fill to prevent voids and according to the IPC 6012D, a void is acceptable if it doesn't exceed 25% area of the filled microbia. Now you obviously don't want voids and you don't want solution in there, but it is acceptable to IPC. And uh, stack vias ensure a uniform impedance, so that could be an advantage. Um, the reliability is impacted when pressure is exerted on the microwave from the Z axis of the dielectric. So this is, you know, the typical mismatch of CTE of the materials, which is dielectric and copper. You have to pay more close attention to that. Um, So the greater the number of stack vias, the higher the cost and the more chance of a separation uh, during uh, thermal excursions. So you have to be very careful about that. So these are the pros and cons. I'm gonna take a quick break and hand it over um, to uh, our software team. And from there, uh, Vandana can give a quick demo. I'm going to stop share and pass it over to Vandana. Thank you, Saul. We present the VIA current capacity and temperature rise calculator. 
This tool is based on the trace current capacity formulas given in the IPC 2152 standard. Default units of all the parameters are present in the right of the parameter fields. You can change the units for these parameters independently using the drop down for each field. For VR plating thickness, the available units are ounce, mils, millimeter, and micrometer. Similarly, the units for temperature can be selected between degree Celsius and Fahrenheit. You can select the different units for VR drill diameter, VR height, maximum current capacity, the resistance, voltage drop, and the power loss. Click on the help button next to each parameter to learn more about them. To use the calculator, we start by entering the ambient temperature. For instance, let us take 30 degrees Celsius. The VR plating thickness as one ounce, the VR height as 63 mils. Let us take the temperature rise above ambient as 40 degrees Celsius and the maximum VR current capacity as 4 amperes. Now, if you want the VR diameter, click on the calculate button next to the VR diameter field. We can see that the required diameter is 15.1866 mils. Along with the VR diameter, our calculator also calculates the DC resistance at ambient temperature. At high temperature, the voltage drop across the VR at maximum current capacity and the power loss at maximum VR current. We can also find the maximum VR current capacity if we know the temperature rise above ambient and the VR drill diameter. Let us change the VR diameter to 10 mils and click on calculate next to the maximum VR current capacity. It shows that the maximum VR current capacity is 3.07 amperes. Similarly, if we know the VR diameter and current capacity, we can calculate the temperature rise above ambient. Let us assume a 10 mil VR and a maximum current capacity is 5 amperes. The calculated temperature rise is 105.9 degrees Celsius above ambient temperature. Back to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Okay, you guys can see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, for, for microvias and for stacked or staggered and even uh, buried mechanicals, it's always good to get, you know, the reliability assessed and that's done through cross sections. So cross sections are a really important tool um, for the customer as well as the manufacturer. Uh, we cross section quite a bit uh, throughout the day. We're constantly cross sectioning to make sure that the work in progress that we're doing is good quality as well as there's no quality issues. Um, and in regard to meeting, let's say, a class three requirement uh, or a wrap requirement or uh, anything like that. So we're looking at, at that as the work goes through the facility. But basically, it's a destructive analysis. It's usually done through a coupon, and the coupon goes undergoes the same fabrication process as the actual board, either in prototype or production. And, uh, you know, you want to verify the coupons before you start destroying actual boards. Uh, so that's the, the idea of the coupon. And, you know, you're checking for things like on the bottom left, we have a list, um, you know, uniformity of plating, again, voids in the microbial, like I talked about, any cracks in the barrels or any separation. So if you, again, if you have stacked vias or even staggered vias, you don't want to have any separation. The bottom of the laser drill microvia has to be, have to have a good connection to the layer beneath. Uh, so all that is checked in uh, micro sections. So super important um, tool. And, uh, you know, if it's a microvia, 
uh, and it's going to be filled, we just fill the whole microvia shut. And we the, there's chemistry that plates from the bottom up so that, you know, you can avoid your, you know, your voids. If you're using a regular plating tank, normal plating tank, you could easily have voids in your microvias. So that's not a good thing. So make sure your fabricator has the right chemistries to do filled microvias. And if it's a through hole via, um, you know, normal requirements are eight tenths, nine tenths. Most fabricators will beat those requirements. Um, and then you can also plate more into the hole let's say up to two ounces in the hole. It just depends on how big that via is and still have a um, good fluid dynamics um, to plate, to continue to continue plating into that via. And I would encourage people to ask more questions and I can tailor the presentation more to the, to the audience. So when you're building microvias, uh, laser drilled microvias and stacked microvias or staggered microvias, uh, it's important to know how we're going to build it. What's the build strategy? So what comes into play is the number of laminations and whether the laminations are sequential laminations or laminations that are done in parallel. Uh, you know, that's, that becomes an important discussion point. So here, uh, we're talking about sequential lamination. And sequential lamination basically uh, is a well-accepted process for building your laser-drilled microvia structures. And however, only certain materials really are suitable for sequential laminations and certain materials are not suitable for sequential lamination. So again, going back to what's the build strategy that you're gonna be using or that the fabricator is gonna be using to build your board. But essentially the number of laminations increases the overall process, which can increase yield loss, which can uh, also increase cost. So knowing your build strategy is really critical. Uh, So we have a material selector, which really talks about whether, um, you know, is it, it, it goes through all the material properties, uh, glass transition temperature, the decay value and uh, CTE, which is important. And then the loss tangent for higher speed designs. Um, and then, you know, is it suitable for sequential lamination? Uh, and so this is, these are the materials we recommend. Uh, 370HR is very popular in the States. Uh, a lot of isolar materials are popular in the States. Also the Megtrons. And if you need a polyamid, um, if you're going into space or something, you have those options as well, Melco and Arlon. So I encourage you to use our material selector. It has really a lot of um, great uh, information and you can compare and contrast. At the prototype stage, not everyone has all the materials in stock. And so if you are posed with the question, should, you know, we don't have this in stock, can you select another material? This would be a great tool to jump into and see, uh, see if there's another alternative. So I will hand over for a quick demo again uh, to Vandana. We present the material selector tool that allows you to search and filter out the rigid and flex materials from the database that best suits your design needs. If you load the tool and click on the go button without selecting any criteria, the tool lists out all the available rigid materials in the database. There are various criteria for material selection. The first being the material type. You can choose either the flex or the rigid materials. You can select yes for the halogen materials or click all for halogen based materials as well. 
If you are specifically looking for materials with a high thermal conductivity, you can click on the third option too. You can also filter out the materials based on their electrical properties. The materials have been cat categorized four times depending on the speed and loss. You can select the category from the drop down list, the operating frequency range of what is, or you can enter either the maximum signal frequency content, the highest data transfer rate, or the fastest signal rise to select the materials. If we enter any one of the parameters, for example, the maximum signal frequency content as 20 gigahertz, the remaining two are automatically calculated. The other filters are the dielectric constant, the dissipation factor, the CTI class, and the dielectric electrical strength. You can use the sliders and the dropdown to adjust the range of the values of the material property. The materials can be chosen based on the thermal properties like the glass transition temperature, the thermal decomposition temperature, the coefficient of thermal expansion in the xy axis and z axis, and of course, the thermal conductivity. Click on the help content to know more about the corresponding parameter. Under the chemical properties, we have the moisture absorption and an option to select the calf resistant materials or not. Under mechanical properties, you can use the tensile modulus, the tensile strength, and the flexural strength. You can also directly choose the materials by selecting the family name from the drop down or using the ma material manufacturer list. Click uh, another category is the IPC and the slash number of the material. Click on go and the materials with the selected filters will be displayed. Here you can click on view to open the detailed data sheet of the material. Different properties like the CT, the degradation temperature, the dielectric constants, the dielectric loss tangent, etc. are all listed here. For all the materials in the table, you can also find an HDI preferred column in which we have noted if the material is HDI preferred or not. Another feature is to tick the checkboxes for all or the desired materials and click on compare to open a side-by-side -side comparison of the selected materials. You can also change the unit system from imperial to metric. Note that if the material table does not list any materials, then readjust the above filters and click on the submit again. Thank you very much. Now let us go back to the slides. Yeah, thanks, Manma. So here we have um, explanation of you know, what does IPC, how does IPC describe uh, the stack ups? Uh, so it's defined as I plus N plus I, and I represents the number of sequentially laminated layers and N is the number of sequential laminations uh, required. So you can have options such as one plus N plus one, two plus N plus two, and uh, four plus N plus four. The most commonly used, let's say, is two plus N plus two, which uh, could be, um, you know, it would support most of the BGA requirements out there uh, in terms of high density BGAs. So, so when you're doing your build, you have two options. You can build sub lambs and you can, or you can do stacked or staggered BGAs. The stacked or staggered uh, comes with its advantages over sub lambs, as we discussed. Um, as well as um, one thing that you haven't mentioned is registration. So when you're building sequentially, it means that before you laser drill and plate, you can skive down to the layer right before and see 
how things have, how the material has moved around and re-register the layer that you're working on. So you get better registration if you take the sequential lamination approach with stacked and staggered DS. It might be more laminations sometimes, and it might be the same number of laminations depending, but it gives you that advantage for sure. Okay. So these also have electrical advantages. So in the you know compact structures of staggered and stacked microvias, you can decrease your parasitic capacitance and parasitic induct inductance by one tenth of the through hole. So there are some advantages there. And so the via stub length gets reduced significantly and the signal reflections are then also minimized uh, in your design. Something that uh, uh, is uh, you know, possible is to calculate, okay, do I need microbias or not? And so I'll pass it uh, again back uh, to the software team to, to illustrate this. At the end of that demo, we will go over some very specific stack up uh, examples of what was designed and how we built them. The maximum via stub length calculator helps to determine the optimum stub length and its resonant frequency. At resonant frequency, a via stub functions as a resonant circuit and can store maximum energy. Hence, the length of the via stub should be within an acceptable range to avoid signal integrity issues. To calculate the maximum via stub length, you need to enter the dielectric constant and any one among the maximum data transfer rate, fastest signal rise time, maximum frequency content, and the 3 dB bandwidth. You can choose the input parameter you wish to enter by selecting the checkbox right next to the desired field. Let us assume a dielectric constant I think there's an audio issue. Yeah. So she's having some challenges. We'll definitely revert back. So microviews with shorter lengths radiate less and thus reduce the EMI. They decrease the routable area and allow designers to place traces farther apart. That leads to mitigate the chance of coupling and crosstalk. And it is possible to incorporate ground path near to the source signal. This decreases the return the distance and eliminates both the EMI and the crosstalk. These are excellent advantages. So now some, uh, some case studies. Um, there, was, there is one question um, that I think we would need the design team to answer. Um, we do have uh, experience with high speed differentials and um, you know, how to properly design for that in the class two and a class three uh, board. And um, when you're doing a, um, also in that question, which I, I can answer is, you know, the layer to layer tolerances. Um, so again, in the sequential lamination, uh, you're basically less than a mil off uh, because you're basically registering to the layer below. In a sublam, and if you guys are interested, I can show you the machine that kind of looks at the misregistration or shit that's happened um, from our factory floor, floor. But in a sublam, you know, you you really have less control because 
you know, maybe it's a one to four sub lamb and, you know, and then an eight to five and, you know, each one of those can shift slightly differently. And so it's, you don't have as much control because once it's laminated, you're done. Uh, so in this case study, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but in this case study, uh, you know, we, it's an HDI board with uh, eight layers and the inner and outer layer uh, thickness requirements are half ounce and one ounce. The total board thickness is 48 mils. And the design has via structures from one to three and one to four and five to eight. And it also has control impedance traces. And the minimum spacing is three mils. So what were what are the challenges here? So we have to consider aspect ratio. We have to consider um, the annular ring requirement. Um, so there's less breakout um, or no breakout. And, you know, we have a, uh, uh, we have to think about how we want to build this product. If there's control impedance requirements, then you have material thicknesses which play into aspect ratio as well. So how did we solve these design challenges or I should say manufacturing challenges once the design has been done? So here we split the via structures and that and went to more of a sequential uh, lamination mentality. So here the blind via from one to three was split between a one to two and a two to three and uh, one to four etc can be split likewise one to two, two to three, three to four. So th that was possible in this case and so that's what we did. Now this is stacked and so if there if if the design has room, think about this ahead of time that I should design it with sequential lamination in mind and do I have room to stagger? That would uh, make your manufacturing less costly, more reliable, et cetera, et cetera. And the fabricator wouldn't have to think too hard about how to build the product um, with what you've already designed in. The case study two, it's a 14 layer board HDI, a total thickness of 138. The design has uh, one to two, three to 14, and 13 to 14. So I wanna point something out. Um, and the, sorry, the minimum line trace is three mils and these are the uh, respective copper weight requirements, right? So because the copper weight requirements are greater than one ounce, you, you do have some uh, etching challenges. And uh, what I wanted to point out is that if you have a via structure, for example, uh, three to 14, and 13 to 14, and both of those via structures have to be filled um, and capped, then it requires two, <clears throat> two extra plating steps on layer 14. So it becomes, you have to really watch the thickness of the copper on that layer um, when you're, so that you can finally, you know, achieve your three mil uh, traces and etch. So these are all uh, challenges. So in this case, uh, you know, there's, there, it's a, also unbalanced. You can see that there's a 60 mil uh, structure, 60 mil core, um, layer one to two, and that's also often done for high speed requirements, which is fine. 
but you can't really do a blind via at that point. And then the blind via from three to 14 is difficult due to the core construction of the stack up. And, um, you know, you're going to end up with an unbalanced construction, which can warp. And then I already talked about the plating issue. So this is how we finally decided to build this product. So a via between layers one and two, we process it as a sub lamp. So you could think of it as a two layer board. And then we laminated it to a three to 14 structure. And the three to 14, we also had blind vias uh, on that side as well. So after the final lamination, we would do like the 14 to 13 blind via and, and then fill that. So the top side is uh, a core construction and the bottom side was a foil uh, construction. So kind of an interesting uh, stack up and uh, how, we, how we solved it. Uh, so, uh, we also have a, we're not getting too many questions, which is interesting, uh, but we have, uh, also a stack up tool. And if, uh, you know, I'd like Lemonon to show that to you. So basically a stack up tool takes your, your highest pin count or dentist BGA and kind of gives you a stack up that would properly break that out. Uh, and so now you're designing from the beginning with the thought process of sequential lamination uh, due to your high density requirements, uh, which will lead to a better, uh, a lower cost and a better quality product and your fabricator less thinking in terms of how to build the product. Uh, and to meet your requirements. And the other, the other quick thing is that even if you don't need HDI, let's say you have a one millimeter BGA or a 0.5 pitch millimeter BGA and you don't necessarily need the micro vias, um, think about your total dimensional, total dimensional space. And do you have space for test points? Do you have space for minimizing your, uh, any sort of EMI interference? So even though if you don't absolutely need HPI, it might still be a good um, decision to actually go with HDI to help with, uh, you know, having more test points, higher yield in production, uh, and better signal integrity overall. So those are my kind of uh, guiding uh, principles on on this, and uh, if and then I can. Um, if I'm, I'm I could demo the, uh, the HDI tool for just a little bit, just to show it, I think that would be great. And, um, you know, there's, there's always a question of, you know, how many laminations, uh, can we go? And the answer is as much as the material will allow without degrading too much. So, um, like a 4N4 structure is possible and we do it, but what is the temperature cycle in that lamination process? And what is the reliability of the material after lamination is done? And then again, you have assembly probably on both sides. And that requires another two thermal excursions. So you and then if you have any rework or hand touch up, um, so again, even more thermal excursions. So four and four is possible to manufacture, but you have to, the limitation is the material and whether it would withstand that. Uh, so we don't recommend a four and four structure. And I think most designs can handle a two and two and be very successful. And then if you need three and three, go, go with that. Um, I think only in very rare special cases would you need a four and four. And the other thing, which is still 
it's not commercial quite yet, but we are now able to do smaller than two mil tracing space. And so if you have a need for four and four, if you go to two mil tracing space, do you still need four and four? Um, if you go less than two mil tracing space, do you still need four and four to break out all your uh, nets? So you, I would make the decision to go smaller trace within space before adding that fourth lamination. So there are trade-offs, you can discuss it with your manufacturer. And these software tools are for you. So if you guys have any suggestions, we will absolutely take them. So I've seen a few suggestions on the chat um, and that is great. Um, Bandana, can you show the stack up tool? Yes. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, okay. You can and see my screen. So this is our uh, stack up designer tool, and uh, um, so you need to give some basic board information like your project name. Let's say a demo. Uh, any revision number, so revision one, let your PCB size. So for example, like two by two, uh, you need to give, uh, what's your target PCB thickness is. So from this drop down, you can select, uh, choose some standard thicknesses. So I'll take, uh, 062 inches. Um, then we have a bunch of materials. We have around 11 different materials from different vendors when take, uh, we have um, Rogers material. So um, you can choose what type of material you want for your stack up. Um, you choose the PCB type, say rigid. Uh, we have a material compare guide. So you can, as we, as you have seen our material selector tool, we also have it in the, in this tool as well. So you can compare the materials uh, depending on you can compare the properties of the material and view the properties of the material. Now there are two steps you can go ahead with one. You know, the number of layers which are required in your design or the other one is if you have a complex BGA and that BGA dictates the, what type of, uh, um, stack up that you should use for your design. So either you can choose the first option where you enter the number of layers, etc. And the second option is when you have a complex BGA. So we'll go with the second one where I have a complex BGA. Uh, then you need to give some details about the BGA that you have. So we have about five different patterns of BGAs to select. And you need to give how many pins are there in, uh, in the X and in the Y direction. So if I take the first one, let's say I have 25 and 25 pins in this BGA. Then you need to select the pitch of the BGA. Um, so uh, one millimeter pitch, pointed millimeter pitch. So let's say I have a point, pointed millimeter pitch BGA. So we, depending on the input, we calculate the total number of pins and the estimated number of signal pins. You can change this value. Uh, if you know the exact number of pin, uh, signal pins that you have in your BGA. So let's say I have 400 pins and click on the run stack up designer tool. So we have an algorithm which will use your BGA data and will recommend you some stack ups which will support their BGA. Um, so you can see the total number of, uh, there are multiple options here with the different total number of layers, uh, how many number of signal plane layers to be used, what kind of technology that you need to use like HDI2, HDI1 where the number represents the how many number of sequential laminations that are required. So HDI two, you need two sequential lamination, uh, HDI one, you need one sequential lamination. And yeah. Oh, so this is the, then the thickness in which what we have selected above that is mentioned and then what is the technology level that to be used? So we have like three different technology levels where in one technology level is finer than the other technology level. So that is mentioned. And finally the cost index. 
So this cost index is based on uh, the number of layers, what material is selected, what is thickness is selected. So depending on that, we have a cost index factor, which gives you a relative idea of how costly the stack up will be with respect to the other um, stack up. So um, I think there was a question for uh, HDI three. So you can, we have this help section where uh, we have explained uh, what each um, HDI, how, uh, how the VR structure is. So basically a standard will have only through VR. Now HDI zero will be like zero and zero. So there is only one lamination and it only allows VRs, uh, blind VRs on outer layers. Uh, the HDI one is the uh, one N one kind of scenario wherein uh, there is a base lamination and then there is one sequential lamination. So it allows VR structure, something like this. Then here you see the uh, two and two uh, VR structure wherein the inner core lamination and then there are two sequential lamination. Similarly, there is this three and three HDI three stack up and then finally the HDI four stack up. So, um, they, they have the, explained in details. Yeah. I was going to say we have the HDI four to be complete, but again, from manufacturing standpoint, wouldn't necessarily recommend it. <laughs> Yeah, so now you can click on the report. So if I say eight layer HDI two, click on the report, you move on to this report page, wherein the details, the uh, stack up details are given and you can see the inputs and also the BGA pattern that you have selected with all the inputs. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. What's really nice is that we can now output the IPC 2581 standard and the PCB designers on the call, you can import the stack up into your tool and not have to data enter anything, which is very nice. And uh, I highly recommend that. Even if it's a standard stack up, you can see we, we offer a standard stack up in our, in our tool. You can download that and uh, import that into your uh, into your design software. I think I know Cadence offers it, Cadence Allegro. I'm not sure if Altium offers an import into IPC 2581 yet for the stack up. Okay, well, I, uh, there are some good questions, electrical questions, which I don't necessarily have the answer to. Uh, so I would, I'm going to pass those on to our uh, design team. Um, is there anyone that can, so the question we have, one question we have is that um, when you're lowering your trace width in space, um, uh, and you have like a dielectric requirement of 3.5, how does that Im impact the impedance? Um, so, uh, I mean, I think that's the question. You can run our, run through our impedance tool and see what is the impact when you lower the trace width. Um, let's say if you have a differential pair, if you lower the trace width and spacing, but you keep the dielectric the same, um, what happens to your uh, impedance requirements and whether if it stays within your budget or if it's not within your budget anymore. That's what I would recommend actually, rather than just giving an anecdotal answer. And uh, someone asked about the cost of the stack up tool and the stack up tool is free. 
and it's free because uh, we want to educate as many designers as we can about the proper way to design a stack up for manufacturability. So it helps the complete ecosystem. It helps us, it helps you, it helps uh, anyone in the industry that would have to build that board. So yeah, it's free. You might get a marketing call, just fair warning. So thank you guys um, for all the questions. Um, we have one more about impedance. Yeah, I saw that one. I think that's a an important question to other. I'm gonna answer that one offline, but yeah. Traces, space, traces and spaces going thinner, you would need to reduce the dielectric thicknesses and that's not okay for class three. So that is a real, a real rock in a hard place. I'll, I'll see if anyone else has a better answer at Sierra, but thanks for asking the question. Okay, and then another question from the same person. Just to double check, is 3.55 mil material the thinnest material for class three? I think it's three mils. I need to double check. Um, I think three mils after lamination. But I will double check the requirement and get back to you. Okay, well, it seems like, ah, oh, one more question. The finest PCB your stack up planner appears to support is 0 0.031 inches. Is there any way to target thinner total thickness? Um, if you have a thinner, thinner, multi-layer requirement, let's say thinner than, it's a four-layer board and you want to go thinner, I think it's possible. You start talking about six and eight layers and you want to be thinner. Um, I would say that's a very special board. It's very possible. Um, but I think it's a good suggestion for the in design team to improve the tool. When you have okay. thinner, I just want one, one caution. When you have thinner materials um, and multiple um, laminations, every time you're going through a sequential lamination, it goes through our whole facility again. And within materials, there's always a handling issue um, so that you can have more yield lost with the thinner materials. But if it's a requirement, it's a requirement. And then at mass production, I'm sure uh, you know there'd be less yield loss due to handling. But thin cores are always a little bit more difficult to handle. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, it seems like we no longer have any questions. But anyway, I will send an email tomorrow. So if you can think of anything, you can just reply to the email and we'll get back to you. Uh, thank you to Amit for presenting the webinar, Vandana and Pranav for demoing the tools. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a good day, everyone.